mentors are part of the income of the church. There is a small team of volunteer guides who take groups round. As current restrictions mean that we cannot take parties around, we have prepared a series of short talks on the history windows in the church. The normal charge for a full tour is £5, but perhaps you'd be kind enough to make a donation to listen to the talk. A suggested donation is £1. Details will appear on the screen. Thank you. Welcome to this first talk in a series of three looking at four of the stained glass windows in St. Batolph's Church, Boston. The windows are our history windows and give an insight into the history of the town and its connection to the church. All of the stained glass in St. Batolph's is later than 1853 and the windows that we will be looking at in more detail in the series were designed in the mid-1940s and installed in 1947 and 1948. All four windows were designed by Harry Grills. Harry and his father Thomas were highly regarded stained glass window designers and were well known for their attention to detail on hands and faces. These details are great features in our windows. Harry's workshop was badly damaged by bombing in the early 1940s and his work was at a standstill as no orders were coming in. Then Boston's request came in for four windows and Harry and one assistant started up the workshop again, in spite of the continuing threat of bombing this time from doodlebugs. Harry did full-size cartoons that were presented to the church council for their approval. If you visit the church, three of the windows are on the north side of the nave, and the fourth is in the Cotton Chapel. They are large windows made up of a tracery section of a gospel scene, a centre section of four figures, and bottom panels depicting two scenes from the life of the church or from the town of Boston. Today's talk is on this window. The window was bequeathed by Annie Clark in 1944, was installed in 1948. The tracery shows scenes from the Transfiguration of Christ with Moses and Elijah and a rather nice, colourful depiction of Christ entering Jerusalem on a donkey on Palm Sunday. The scene is a great favourite with school children who visit the church. The row of figures below shows the skill of Harry Cross, as the ladies have fine features and their hands are holding an item precious to them. We will look at them from left to right. Anne of Bohemia, born in 1366 and died in 1394. She's depicted here as Queen of England with a crown and scepter, the first wife of Richard II. Richard's symbol of a white heart appears at her feet. She's dressed in royal colour of red and trimmings of gold. Anne was the eldest daughter of Charles IV, the Holy Roman Emperor and King of Bohemia. Richard was desperate to marry this beautiful young girl, but his choice of bride was not popular with the English nobility, as she would come with no dowry. In fact, by the time of the marriage, her father had died and Richard had to pay her brother £4 million in today's money and also had to pay for the upkeep of her large retinue of 250 followers and servants. Her brother was Wenceslas IV, perhaps not good King Wenceslas as far as the English were concerned. However, the union did bring many benefits to English merchants as they were permitted to trade freely in Bohemia and the Holy Roman Empire. The marriage took place in 1382. Boston was a thriving port and rich wool town, and Richard gave Anne the manor of Boston as a gift. She's holding the deeds in her hands. Anne worked hard to win the hearts and minds of the English people. She was intelligent, well-read, knew the scriptures in three languages, and was kind and generous to the poor. She secured pardons for those involved in the Peasants' Revolt, and put the religious reformer John Wycliffe under her protection. She and Richard were married for 12 years and were devoted to one another, but sadly the union was childless. She died of bubonic plague in 1394, leaving Richard distraught. He went into decline and lost his grip on power. He was deposed just five years later by his cousin Henry Bolingbroke. 
Anne is buried in a tomb that cost £933 in 1396, which is about £1.1 million today, and it's in the chapel of Edward the Confessor in Westminster Abbey. Richard's body was exhumed in 1413, and he's buried now with her in the tomb. The next lady is Lady Margaret Beaufort, born in 1443 and died in 1509. Margaret was a formidable lady who became very powerful and exerted great authority over her son, Henry Tudor, who defeated Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth to become Henry VII. Her second grandson became Henry VIII, who, during the Reformation, made many changes to his grandmother's great religious works and beliefs. Margaret had connections to this part of the world as a descendant of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, who had lands in Lincolnshire and lived at Bolingbroke Castle. John's son became Henry IV, the first Lancastrian king after deposing Richard II. Margaret owned lands around Boston and in other parts of Lincolnshire that brought her a good income. As a child, she was a wealthy heiress, had an early marriage at the age of six, which was annulled, and was then married off to Edmund Tudor at the age of 12. She was widowed at 13, three months before her only child, Henry Tudor, was born. Difficulties with the birth of Henry meant that she was not able to bear any more children. Edmund's brother, Jasper Tudor, married a, her off to Henry Stafford, son of the Duke of Buckingham, when she was 14 years and seven months old, and Jasper took control of little Henry. She did not see much of him for the next 28 years, but she never stopped fighting for him and his rights. Margaret narrowly avoided being charged with treason against Richard III, and she had to forfeit all her titles and her lands to her fourth husband, Thomas Stanley. Stanley was undecided which side to back at the Battle of Bosworth, and it was only when he came in on Henry's side late in the day that it gave her son victory and the crown of England. Margaret used her power at court to strengthen her own position. In his first parliament, Henry declared that his mother could sue in any legal action herself and have sole possession of all her properties and titles, highly unusual if you had a surviving husband. She also used her position to do what she saw as important work in the church, the funding of religious work and the creation of educational establishments such as Christ College and St. John's College, Cambridge. In our window, she's depicted in beautiful blue robes trimmed with gold, a symbol of her high status. And she's holding a model of the gatehouse of St. John's College in her hands. She used her, her influence to help Boston in several ways. She gave money to two of Boston's prestigious guilds who, in turn, funded churches and trade in the town. She tried to lure the Hanseatic merchants back to the town by offering favorable terms but they rejected her offer. She was the first to think about flood defense for the town and surrounding land. Margaret held a large amount of land around Boston, and by 1495, she was tired of the River Witham flooding her fields at certain times of the year, as it was tidal for nine miles north of Boston. She persuaded her son, Henry VII, to appoint a council to consider the construction of a sluice in Boston to hold back the tide. By early 1500, it was all agreed with a loan of 1,000 pounds from the Crown and the appointment of a Flemish engineer, Matthew Hake. Construction began in May 1500 and was completed in the summer of 1502, coming in about 100 pounds over budget. With various repairs, the sluice lasted until 1642 and then fell into serious disrepair and Boston did not get another sluice on the River Witham until 1766. In December 2013, Boston suffered serious flooding after a tidal surge on the East Coast, including one million pounds worth of damage to St. Batolph's. A new tidal barrier was started in January 2018, downriver near the port, and completed in June 2020 at a cost of just over 100 million pounds, and this should protect the town and surrounding land for future years. Margaret Beaufort died a few days after attending her grandson Henry VIII's coronation, and she's buried in the Lady Chapel of Westminster Abbey. The third lady in the window 
is Anne Bradstreet Nee Dudley. She was born in Northampton and in 1628, age 16, she married Simon Bradstreet of Horbling. They became parishioners of St. Botolph's and fell under the influence of the charismatic Puritan firebrand John Cotton, more of whom later. Note Anne's Puritan costume, a simple white cap and simple grey cloak. In 1630, she sailed to the Arbella with her husband and her parents as part of the Winthrop group to found a new collie in America. They landed near Salem in Massachusetts. They eventually moved on to the outskirts of what would become Boston, Massachusetts. Simon was heavily involved in the politics of the colony and became its last governor in 1679. Anne and Simon had eight children, and they depicted as chicks in the basket that she is holding. Anne became the most well-known of the early English poets in North America and was the first to be published. Simon was often away from home, and one of Anne's well-known works was a poem entitled A Letter to Her Husband, Absent on Public Employment. Her descendants include the 31st President of the United States, Herbert Hoover, and Senator John Kerry, was Senator for Massachusetts from 1985 to 2013, and then the 68th Secretary of State until 2017. Her burial place is not known, but it is believed to be the old burying ground in Academy Road, North Andover, Massachusetts. Her husband is buried elsewhere, alongside his second wife, also called Anne. The final lady in our window is Jean Ingelow, who was born in 1820 and died in 1897. Jean is depicted in the window in modest middle-class Victorian costume. She was born in Boston and was the eldest of ten children, and her father had a private bank. Following the failure of the bank, the family moved first to Ipswich and then to London, where she remained for the rest of her life. She was well known during her lifetime as a poet, a novelist and a children's author, and several of her novels were reviewed in the New York Times. Some of her poems became the lyrics of popular Victorian parlour songs. Her most famous poem, published in 1863, was High Tide on the Coast of Lincolnshire, 1571. The people of Boston are waiting for someone to write a sequel for 2013. Any takers? Jean's childhood home was in South Square and it was demolished in the late 1960s to make way for a much needed road bridge over the Tidal River and the inner relief road in the town. Part of the site is now a lovely wildflower garden where the blackbird's song competes with the roar of the traffic. Jean is buried in Brompton Cemetery, London. The history section in this window looks at the 1600s. The first two sections on the left are perhaps the most important pieces of stained glass in the church. They link the history of the church with the history of the town and the history of America. They make up a scene of the hapless Puritan priest and followers waving to a departing ship, the coastal background that is not on the Lincolnshire coast. There is a hill behind. The priest is John Cotton, whom I mentioned when talking about Anne Bradstreet. John had already spent 14 years studying at Cambridge when he was appointed minister at St. Petolf's Church in 1612 at the tender age of 26. The Town Corporation of Boston was so delighted at the appointment of such an outstanding scholar and preacher that they paid for a magnificent pulpit to be installed in the church. It is rumoured that Cotton regularly preached from this pulpit for five hours at a time. The carved wooden pulpit is still in position and much photographed by visiting Americans. US Ambassador Joseph Kennedy, the father of President John F. Kennedy, visited in the late 1930s, and US Ambassador Matthew Winthrop Barson visited a few years ago. John Cotton wanted to preach in a simple manner and do away with many of the ceremonies and vestments of the Church of England. And like many of his fellow nonconformists, he wanted to make changes from within which was not popular with church authorities. He did not believe in standing for the creed, kneeling for the Eucharist, did not like organ music nor singing in parts. However, he was a charismatic leader 
had the support of the local aldermen and certain bishops, and was able to remain in post at Boston for 20 years. Boston was an island of Puritan nonconformity. Boston's change to nonconformist Puritanism in the early 1600s was at odds with the attitude of 100 years earlier. For in 1536, 2,000 Boston men took part in the Lincolnshire Rising, which became part of the Pilgrimage of Grace against the break with Rome. Even today, townsfolk have the reputation for not always conforming. Several years ago, they voted off 75% of Main Street party councillors in local elections and elected a group of independents. And in 2016, 75% voted in favour of Brexit, the largest majority in Britain. The scene in the window is from 1630 and shows the ship Arbella. Arbella was part of the fleet of 11 ships carrying 700 to 1,000 non-conformist pilgrims together with provisions and livestock and it left from Yarmouth, Isle of Wight in April and May 1630 and arrived in Salem in June and July of that year. John had married Elizabeth Horrocks in 1613, but they both fell ill in 1631 and Elizabeth did not survive. Sadly, they had no children. In 1632, he married again, Sarah Story. By 1632, the pressure on him from church leaders was so great he fled Boston with his new wife. He resigned his post in 1633 and left on a ship bound for the new colony. And on the voyage, his first son was born and he called him Seaborn. John and Sarah went on to have two more sons and three daughters. John Cotton helped to found the Massachusetts Bay Colony and instigated many civil and religious reforms. His time in Boston, America was not without controversy and he became more conservative in his later years, and in 1652 he caught a chill and died at the age of 67. It's believed that about 250 Boston Puritans followed him to a new life in America, including a mayor, an alderman, a lawyer, a member of parliament, a wealthy merchant, a surgeon, and the headmaster of Boston Grammar School. The Boston men dominated the colony for the first 85 years. They founded the Boston Free Latin School, the foundation of public education in America. The school was modeled on Boston Grammar School. There is a plaque under the tower in Simbatov detailing the governors of the colony, and there is a stone in the churchyard for each of the original Boston colonists on Arbella. The next two sections depict the foundation of the library in Simbatov's church. The library is above the south door and is undergoing renovation and reordering and is currently closed to the public. Some volumes are on display in cases in the church, and a new display case has just been installed, which displays a first edition of Fox's Book of Martyrs. John Fox was born in a property fronting Boston Marketplace, a stone's throw from the church. The permission for restoration of the church and the founding of a library was granted by Archbishop Lord in 1634, and John Cotton's successor, Dr. Anthony Tuckney, is depicted with Lord in the library. Their faces are well drawn and their hands are full of books. And the barley twist rail behind Archbishop Lord is still in place. An interesting detail concerns the little man in green about to put books on the table. He has the face of master craftsman and long serving verger of the church, Ernest Holton. It was to honor him for all his work for St. Bertolf's. He took care of the fabric of the building, collected church rents, looked after the marriage and baptism registers, the visitor's book, collected money for books and postcards, kept the accounts, answered inquiries from the public, cleaned some parts of the church on a daily basis, as well as looking after all the tasks in preparation for services. He lived in a small house next to the church and served St. Bertolt's for a total of 24 years and sadly died just as he was about to retire. His retirement collection was given to his widow. Archbishop Lord was Archbishop of Canterbury. He took up his post in 1633 and was executed for treason in 1645, following his earlier arrest in 1640. There will be more information on the Archbishop in the next talk in this series, as he features more prominently in another window in the church. 
Dr. Anthony Tugney was born in 1599 and died in 1670 and was the son of Mr. Tugney, the Minister of Curtin, a small town about four miles from Boston. He was 14 when he graduated from Emmanuel College, Cambridge, and he went to be the domestic chaplain to the Earl of Lincoln. He went back to Cambridge and became a professor of divinity and trained many pupils who became influential in the Church of England and the state. He was chosen by the people of Boston to succeed John Cotton. He had a rough time in Boston and also had a brush with the ecclesiastical court. In 1643, he was called by the Long Parliament to sit in the Assembly of Divines in London, which was a council to restructure the Church of England. In view of the uncertain times in civil war, he took his family with him to London and never returned to Boston. However, he remained very popular with the townsfolk of Boston and kept his title of Minister of Boston until 1660, when he resigned when Charles II came to the throne. In 1661, he was asked to resign as Master of St John's College, Cambridge. And ironically, in 1666, he sadly lost his own library in the Great Fire of London. That concludes the first talk on the history windows of St Patol's Church. Thank you for joining us today. The next talk in the series features the two other history windows on the north side of the nave. One window features history panels covering the 1700s and the other the 1800s. The final talk will look at the lovely west window in the Cotton Chapel. I do hope that you'll be able to join us. Goodbye.